This year's Truth About Wide Receivers episode is actually pretty important. I think there are a couple big takeaways of wide receivers in general that we can apply prescriptively to the future. Plus, we have some major news, major coaching news, and a goat is put out to pasture. Make sure you like, subscribe, and enjoy. Welcome to the Fantasy Footballers Podcast with your hosts, Andy Holloway, Jason Moore, and Mike Wright. Ah, welcome in. Thursday, February 2nd. I know, for sure. Totally for sure. <laughs> Proud of you. Jason has a post-lunch, post-pickleball glisten. Uh, like over my eyes? Yeah, glaze, uh, a glazing. Yeah, just... I'm 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 here, but I'm behind, uh, like several sheets. Uh, yeah, no, I know get what, what you're saying. saying. Yeah. yeah, like a like a filter. Yeah, like, like a real I'm, life? Look, I'm looking through like a, a Gaussian blur. Yeah, exactly. ah. across his eyes. Yes, and I'm far. I'm down a hallway. And uh, welcome into the show, Mike Wright. Is, is, is that here. a sick Photoshop reference? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, it is a sick Photoshop <laughs> reference. Welcome in truth episode today. Looking at the top 10 wide receivers on today's show, uh, we have completed what? The quarterbacks, the running backs. That is true. And it's wide receiver truth time. Oh, oh yeah. I wonder what's coming next. Oh, and I cannot wait for the truth kickers? about fantasy tight ends. Tight uh, end. Three episodes for tight ends. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, we go, we really, go to Brooksy. the bottom. The if, <laughs> if you took a snap. At the tight end position, you're in the truth. I can't imagine how little listenership that episode <laughs> would receive. Uh, except for the Will Disley part. Of course. I mean, the Will Disley part would be special. But uh, welcome in, one and all. There is a glisten in Deucer's Alley today because oh, Papa man. Josh is back there. Yeah, put the camera. Yeah, oh. show. Oh. <laughs> Reveal yourself. <laughs> Reveal, yeah, yeah, there it is. Oh, man. Kyle the Borgogan is here. He refuses to put the powder on his forehead, although we do it uh, every day for our faces because this is what you do when, you, when you're in showbiz. You're a professional. No, instead it's reflected. The, the lights are reflecting <laughs> off his dome. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, fun show today. Got some bigger news to talk about we as well. We do. You can find us on Twitter at the FF Ballers. You can follow Jason at JasonFFL. Follow Mike at FF Thick Man. No, <laughs> no, that's FF Hit Man. I'm sorry. We invented a new nickname, yeah. if necessary, at lunch. Yes. Like if worse comes to worse. Well, we yeah, we were, I was trying to get my shout out from Alex on Peloton, and we're like, well, he just not read my name, and I thought, well, what if I change it to FF Thick Man? Yeah. Will he will he give me some love? Because <laughs> I love Alex, and Alex does not love me. Mm -mm. Okay. You can't get a shout out on the Peloton. I've tried. I keep trying. Is it because your name's so boring? I th that's why Mike? we're that's why we're workshopping things like, like and you don't think the hitman you think you'd ignore hitman. I I it seems like a name that should not be ignored. Mm -mm. Right. But it is. Or else never cross yeah. a hitman. <laughs> you can follow me at Andy Holloway. We're on Patreon, join the foot dot com. That's where you get a bonus weekly episode of our podcast. The website's the fantasyfootballers dot com. Exciting stuff coming up. Super Bowl Sunday. That is when the ultimate draft kit for oh. 2023 oh. will be available for pre-order. And on that very day, you will have instant access to the Dynasty Pass, which yes. our, team, our team has been working very hard already. We're in the middle of a rookie mock draft. Team opportunity pages are being built, et cetera, et cetera. It is a delightful time of year. Absolutely. All right, into the news we go because there's, uh, there's some big news. News and notes from around the league. Thomas Brady. The goat is out to pasture. Again. <laughs> uh, he has announced via per social media that he's officially retiring. This time it's personal. He said, I'm retiring for good. It was actually a pretty heartfelt message, as brief as it was. Didn't want to drag it on into offseason. We kind of, 
he probably wanted to leave the off season drag out time to Aaron Rodgers. That's kind yeah. of his. He's laid claim on on stretching out the news. There. I f I feel like this uh, this rubber band's back on Aaron Rodgers. The news won't be stretched out because I think there was legitimate. You know, it, it was a realistic outcome that Aaron Rodgers would walk away from football right now. You know, he's he's still going on the Pat McAfee show and talking about how, you know, oh, these guys are talking about me, but I haven't been involved. I don't even know what I'm going to do. Well, here's what I'm I am confident and I am not Aaron Rodgers, uh, but I am pretty confident he doesn't want to be the second best um, inductee into the Hall of Fame. So if he retires right now. You are not the main event. <laughs> you are behind Tom Brady. It's true. Yeah, I, it's it's a it it should Isn't not there like matter. Fifty the, million dollars at stake too for Rogers for Rogers if he retired. Yeah, he's owed a lot of money. I don't expect him to turn away fifty million dollars. So between those two things, uh, you know there there are people that said the Raiders. You know the number one target for them was Brady in recent days. Some of us in the office may have placed small wagers on Brady to San Francisco. <laughs> what? Who that would were, do that? <laughs> that were evaporated instantaneously. But, you know, uh, one one quarterback off the free agent market for teams that need one. Yeah, and there's another quarterback that is also looking like he will be off the starting market. Uh, Brock Purdy officially yeah. diagnosed with a completely torn UCL in his right elbow. We do not know yet wh which type of surgery he will get. There is bad, and then there is worse. Uh, he, there's either like a six to nine month timeline, which you know is, is not is, nice. Is not nice, and then there's the full Tommy John surgery where he's gone for the year. And in that situation, which I've seen some credible doctors say that that's what they believe will happen. And in that situation, you've got Trey Lance back for sure. He's the starter. And there's no controversy until they <laughs> maybe re-sign Garoppolo, <laughs> and, and and I I am here for that. Yeah, if Kyle Shanahan's not seeking counseling just to talk about his own quarterback <laughs> situation, he will be soon. It, you're right, Brock Purdy's situation it's not good. It's such a bummer, man. And it, you know what's what's crazy is there were there were snap judgments made on Twitter when he didn't come back into the game immediately. And you almost felt it from Shanahan a little bit on the sideline where it was like, you know, you're over there in good spirits. Why aren't you back out there on the field? He, he literally might need Tommy John surgery. So this was a, a devastating injury. Trey Lance, we don't know. He did say he would be 100% by OTAs. Yes. He said. Yes, he, he did say that. And uh, so we'll see. What's, what's kind of wild is Nick Mullins, who was a former backup that started some games in San Francisco, Tore his UCL, and he had the bracing version of the surgery, and I believe he was starting to throw uh, three, four months after, kind of back at it in six months, but we'll see what happens there. Uh, Michael Gallup, more procedures for Michael Gallup, right hey. knee and ankle. Uh, so you've got left knee meniscus in 2019, left knee ACL in 2022, and now what, right knee, right ankle? Yep. So... Dallas needs a wide receiver. It feels I mean, that way. I with, mean, people wanted us to give more credit to Michael Gallup because obviously his injury was very late in the season last year, so not coming back and being ready. Look, it's it's either an indictment on the Cowboys in some capacity, right? You you let Amari Cooper go, and if Gallup wasn't going to be ready, then you needed another. I mean, T.Y. Hilton was part of your offense. Yeah, I mean, obviously, in, in hindsight, they should have stuck with Amari Cooper. That that offense would have been great um, with Amari Cooper and CeeDee Lamb as CeeDee Lamb as the one. But with this uh, injury, I mean, obviously, the, you know, meniscus, I think the timeline is he should be back. I haven't, I haven't dug into the specifics on this, but obviously they have to add a wide receiver. I think they'll do that in the draft. The problem for Dallas was Michael Gallup and the schedule, and he was ahead of schedule. Because everyone who's recovering from an ACL is ahead of schedule, so I'll adjust the schedule so we'll get actual realistic timelines for these players to return. Speculation is super fun when it comes to that stuff, and I, I don't know if they'll do it through the draft or not. Obviously, Jalen Tolbert it didn't work out as a rookie. Right. I think they can only do it through the draft. I mean, I guess unless you're thinking Jacoby Myers or Juju Smith-Schuster are, are the answers, Those there's yeah, just not yeah. a great crop of free agents. There's, there's the kind, though, that fit into the mold of – 
of being complimentary, I think, to CD Lamb. But we'll find out. They they're on the precipice of potentially hiring a new OC that likes to run the football out of Carolina as well. So a couple of coaching updates. The Broncos and Saints, they've agreed to compensation. Sean Payton hey. will be the next head coach of the Denver Broncos. The Broncos sent their 29th overall pick, the first rounder, second rounder next year, and they get Payton and a third. They have no picks. So it, <laughs> this situation was always going to be strange because Payton has to come in and then have fewer assets yeah. on that new team. This was the only path to having another painful offseason of optimism around the Broncos. It's <laughs> unbelievable because when you put Sean Payton with Russell Wilson and midway through this last year when when Sean Payton was an analyst, he was basically saying he thought Hackett was using Russell Wilson incorrectly. And so you bring look, someone look in what I can do. with experience and all the weapons that are on this offense and we are going to have optimism. I said uh, about a month ago, I said that if this move happens, I am not going to be in on Russell Wilson. And I am so happy I said that. Because now you're going to... Because the, tem the temptation <laughs> is there, man. I, th I think this is a good move. I really do. I've seen a lot of people say that they think it's silly to trade that much compensation for Sean Payton. But if you grab a coach that is a long-term, a 10-year type of asset for your franchise... Of course it's worth it. If he fixes Russell Wilson, of course it's worth it. You have to take a shot at these the, things. The, I agree with that, but it, it costs a lot, and you could be wrong. I mean, it could just be Drew Brees that was the linchpin of the Sean Payton success. Like, that is a possibility, uh, and, you know, we're going to find out. We're going to find out with fantasy players and what they believe about these assets, and we'll find out what Sean Payton, you know, he's coming into a team with a really good defense. Literally, they just couldn't get out of their own way on offense. So right. going from one of the worst in the league to the middle might be enough for this team to start competing, but that doesn't mean that they'll be great for fantasy players. One of the things that I do love and respect and expect for the Broncos going forward is that the running game should be significantly better. The The utilization in the, the receiving for running backs, the Sean Payton system – you know, get so much credit for Drew Brees and Michael Thomas and all the passing, but their their team running backs were basically top five yes. for a decade, um, and that's what he's he's spoken about getting that going. So we don't know the health of uh, Javante Williams, but I do think going forward next year they're they're not going to be starting the season with you know Latavius Murray and um, you know retread veteran options that were mid-season pickups and Sean Payton clear like Sean Payton would not make this move from his super cushy broadcast job which I think he was being very transparent saying I have a great job I'm not going to give this up unless I go to a situation that I really want to be in it Sean Payton believes that Russell Wilson can be fixed he he 100% thinks that or, or yeah, he would I mean, not have made this move okay Cause you're, cause you're, I guess I'm less bullish. Well, I mean, sixteen you, to eighteen million dollars a year also makes me make the move regardless. I mean, you're getting paid more than almost anybody else in the league. So maybe you, you know we've seen this a million times with coaches, right? You always believe you can do better. Mike McCarthy just fired Kellen Moore because he believes in himself. He can fix the offense. McCarthy can. So I'm just saying there's there's room on both sides. I don't want to. I'm trying to be the counterbalance to that sentiment that everything's going to be repaired and fixed because oh, I'm, what I'm, we saw in the field was very troubling for a very long period of time. My statement is not, I know for sure that Sean Payton could come in and fix the offense. I'm saying Sean Payton believes that he that Russell Wilson can still be that guy. How many years without Breeze did he coach? Was it just one? one? Okay. Just one. And that's when the offense went... You, you can argue that. You can also argue that the offense was pretty good for a Taysom Hill you know, offense. It wasn't... Um, a, a catastrophe, and he had you know a backup quarterback unexpectedly. All right, one of the other strange parts about the Denver uh, trade for Sean Payton was that they were pushing really hard for D'Amico Ryan's, uh, and at least multiple reports, yeah, that was the preference. D'Amico Ryan's ends up becoming the head coach of the Houston Texans, a team that he was a multi-year uh, Pro Bowler for. Uh, comes, you know, leaves the Forty ers so the Forty ers have lost a couple of DCs in recent years. And a six-year deal to become the Houston Texans 
head coach, you know, great leader, great coach, great opportunity for him in Houston. I like the signing. Yeah, I, I like it. It's it's, it's, it's an uphill climb. It, yeah. it he's, is. he's up against it. That's kind of where, you know, you had two coaches that went back to places that they have familiarity and almost like a nostalgic love for them, which was Carolina with Frank Reich and then now D'Amico Ryan's in Houston. Sometimes you need that, I think, to – yeah, I mean, part of it is to from, attract those. <laughs> I was gonna say part of it's from the the standpoint of the former player now coach coming back home, but a lot of that I think has to do with knowing what your fan base thinks about this. Like uh, the the news around Houston is outrageously high. I heard their beat reporter talk about this is the third best moment in their history of their franchise is bringing in wow. D'Amico Ryan. Like this is seen around there as monumental because he was such a star player for them. And now he's the bell of the ball that they're bringing back home. Franchise is all-time leader in tackles in Houston. D'Amico Ryan. Okay. That is it for the news. It's truth time. You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. You can't handle the truth. All right, the top 10 wide receivers from 2022 diving into the truth. We've looked at a uh, a high-level overview of each position that we've covered so far. We're doing that with wide receivers. They experienced much of what we saw at the quarterback and running back position in respect to uh, touchdowns. The fewest wide receiver receiving touchdowns since 2017 this past year. The second fewest over the last decade. Uh, I, these numbers here are really interesting to look at, which is which teams had the biggest changes in terms of wide receiver target share, which means, you know, how involved were the wide receivers in the offense before and after they made major offseason moves? I mm -hmm. think it's really interesting because you had teams that had major jumps. Philadelphia was number one. They added A.J. Brown. Last year, they were a 51% target share to the wide receiver position. 70% target share in 2022. The Goddard injury probably inflated that sure. even more. That was the biggest in the league, but Miami, they jumped 12.2%. That would be the wide receiver position in Miami with the addition of Tyree Kill and our new head coach. Atlanta, it was kind of a comical thing last year. I mean, they were at 45% target share for wide receivers. They go up to 57%. It's not that high. It's just much higher than they were. It's still a big jump. But Drake London... The addition of Drake London, the loss of Kyle Pitts contributing there, and the Las Vegas Raiders. You add Devontae Adams, you lose Darren Waller for part of the year, and they go up nine point four percent. Yeah, and and the opposite is true as well. A lot of these teams that uh, were dealing with injuries or rookie quarterbacks, they might have gone from teams. You know, the Steelers had a high pass rate to wide receivers two years ago. This last year. Not so much. Uh, that's you know going to be kind of expected when you have a rookie wide receiver come in. Quarterback. Or, or rookie quarterback, yes. I mean, technically right with Pickens, <laughs> sure. but I know what you were saying. And, and you had the the Rams, another uh, – I think they were the second biggest uh, change, and they obviously lost Cup and Stafford. Um, but, yeah, it, it's, it's a telling – Added Allen Robinson. <laughs> right, another negative. Lost Allen Robinson. Yeah. Um, it, it is telling, though, that when these wide receivers change teams – the offensive system obviously was like, well, this is who we want to be. We're making this move because we want to be a pass first, pass to the wide receiver position. And so you got to act accordingly. You know, when we're looking at projections for next year and there's, uh, you know, if, if a team is trading for DeAndre Hopkins, for instance, we, we should expect that offense to change. The worst uh, disparity change uh, in 2022 was the Ravens. The Ravens, not only did you have the Lamar injury, I mean, obviously they were lucky to be able to move to a Pro Bowl or like Ty Oh my goodness. <laughs> like Tyler Huntley in his two two passing touchdowns. Uh we They we, were tremendous though. Those two? Yeah. What but they lost Bateman and they lost Hollywood in the trade that took place with the Cardinals during the draft. So, you know, you didn't have anybody that you could throw the ball to. They went from fifty seven percent, which wasn't that high, but down to forty three percent. Yeah, they so, just didn't have wide receivers. Yeah, and and, and you know the, I don't, I don't know if you have, do you have the target share for the uh, New York Football Giants? I can look it up. Yeah, I'd just be curious because that's one of those situations. Mike Kafka is getting a lot of interviews around. It could be you know the Cardinals and Colts don't have head coaches yet, and it's always hard to evaluate coaches when they don't have 
weapons. Right. You know, it's like, did you do the best with what you had? Like you kind of said with Sean Payton in New Orleans without Drew Brees, did he do the best you could do with those weapons? It's, it's a hard thing to evaluate. That's why bad coaches get hired and good coaches don't get hired. Giants were at uh, 61%. Okay. 61. All right. Well, at the wide receiver position, diving into the truth data, we consider a great game more than 20 points at the wide receiver position. A good game, that's more than 12 points. And a bus game is fewer than eight points. So uh, if you get seven points from a wide receiver, are you are you sitting there going, dang it? Yes. yes. I, I think I think that's yes. a, a very disappointing outcome, especially in half PPR, which is where we, we are. If you're in a standard league, okay, you could survive with seven, but seven is is a pretty lousy game to me. All right, let's talk about Justin Jefferson. He comes in at number one. Drafted uh, at the end of the first round, the wide receiver two off the board. Consistency rank was actually fourth. It's a little interesting to me. 71% good games, 53% great. That number is insane. That 53% numbers... great is give me all the every once in a while busts. If, if you give me 53% great, you are winning me weeks. Yeah, I mean, that is the best number of all wide receivers. That's why he finished as the wide receiver one in fantasy. It is even a higher percentage than the consistency ranked number one wide receiver that we're not going to talk about because he missed half the year, which is Cooper Cup. Um, Cooper Cup was un... He had a lower percentage of great games, you're saying, than Justin he Jefferson? Was, if you take out the injury game, he was at 50% to Justin Jefferson's 53%. So he, he was there, but he even beat that. that. That being said, Cooper Cup was unbelievable. Yeah, he was is it worth good. a moment for Cooper Cup here just it so that is. people don't... His metrics, underestimate the value. His metrics were uh, so if if you take out the injured game where he you know just got injured right away and and maybe that's not fair because you started him that week but just for illustration purposes if you take that out he had fifty percent great games. What do you think his percentage of good games is? <laughs> You're going to tell me it's like fifty percent. It's one hundred percent, one hundred percent great. Fifty percent of those were one hundred percent good and fifty percent were great, like weak winning performances all the time and never a bust. Just always absolutely awesome until he got injured. We know he's coming back. We know Sean McVay's coming back. We he, know Matthew Stafford's coming he back. He finished as the wide receiver 24, and he played nine and a half games. So so, so talk to me for a second at the, good. at the very top of this because it feels a little bit like Jonathan Taylor's CMC situation. Mm -hmm. Last year, a lot of criticism for, for people that wanted to go with CMC. He played 20 games this year. So you won. You won the gamble if you went with him at number one, and you actually lost it, obviously, if you went with Jonathan Taylor. But Taylor was this bona fide, guaranteed number one because of the big season. I, I can't imagine Justin Jefferson is not drafted over Cooper Cup next year. Oh, week. he will absolutely be drafted over Cooper Cup. He's younger. His arrow is pointing up. There's no reason for it to go down. He wasn't dealing with injury. He was the number one wide receiver. I would prefer Cooper Cup next year in a redraft league. I don't yeah. think there's any reason to believe that Cooper Cup – uh, he, he didn't show any sign of slowing down. He's not injured. Like, he could have come back at the end of the year but didn't need to. So, f for my fantasy purposes, I see him as what he has been the last two years, which is a wide gap number one player versus the number two. Yeah, I, I don't mind putting him in the exact – I mean, putting Jefferson in that category with him based on this performance, but I think it's worth talking about Cooper Cup here because we won't get a chance to. He missed a lot of the season. One impressive thing about Justin Jefferson, higher fantasy points per game against top 16 defenses than against bottom 16. They were very comparable, but like he did not falter when the team, you know, you'd expect him to go out there and just try to shut him down. There were a couple games like that, that Green Bay game in championship week, obviously. Oh, man. That was brutal. Uh, the Dallas game. Uh, there were a couple times they, they disappear. They, we're going to start with the refrain here soon of most wide receivers are very inconsistent. So it's going to happen to the best of them. Uh, has the most targets through the first three seasons in NFL history. And uh, what do you say about a guy that just goes out there and gives you weak winning performances 53% of the time? Nothing needed. First I, round pick next I year. I say thank you, Justin Jefferson, <laughs> as part of my championship roster. All right, we will take a quick break and come back with the elite wide receiver duo in Miami. And that's, of course, that elite duo is Albert Wilson and Trent Sherfield. Oh, bird alert. 
Wait. <laughs> you don't remember that? The old uh, the Is Harman? that Albert related? Yeah. Oh, okay. That was from Harmon. Oh, That was my right. Harmon's thing. All right. Well done. Uh, no, it's Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddle. Hill comes in at two. Jalen Waddle at seven, so we'll cover them together. When you look at the Tyreek season, it was it was everything you could have hoped for. Any fears related to Tua were, they were frankly unfounded. I mean, they if you passed on Tyreek Hill, you paid the price. He was he was good seventy six percent of the time. He was great forty one percent of the time. He busted twelve percent of the time. That's a lower bust rate than even Justin Jefferson. And then uh, Jalen Waddle was a 47% good, 18% great, 35% bust. Yeah. But dealt, dealt with injuries. He, he dealt repeatedly. with Repeatedly. He did deal with injuries. He did not miss games, but obviously was hampered during several of the games. Just kept playing and playing poorly. Uh, I, You know, I didn't get to experience Tyreek Hill a lot this last year. I, I don't think I was high enough on him. Um, the Jalen Waddle experience wasn't always great. You did have – you felt – the busts and while there were absolutely weak winning performances there can be no doubt whose team this is maybe three years from now it'll it'll change but Tyree Kill was unbelievably great it might be the best wide receiver this year it, you know he has the consistency rank number two but he played the whole year unlike Cooper Cup he did not let you down he dealt with backup quarterbacks and was great with everybody Going forward, yeah, that is a very good point. Going forward, he, you know, it's, there's no reason to put his arrow pointing down whatsoever. And something that is is interesting is is no teammate uh, who has a, a duo of wide receivers finishing in the top ten, which is the situation here, have repeated that the next season. So you've got Jalen Waddle and Tyree Kill. That one seems that seems really interesting because. On the surface, Jalen Waddle's 24 years old. Like, we saw his, how explosive he was. You would expect him to be able to be here again. And you obviously expect Tyreek to be able to do it. Now, part of that could be, you know, how often do two, mate, two teammates play 17 games two years sure. in a row. But that that's an interesting stat. I mean, Waddle, Waddle was much more up and down. But I think he benefited more from Tua being in the, in the football game. Uh I think it's interesting that Tyreek was much better against bad defenses. It, it, to me, that says a little bit about the quarterback position. Like, it was a big disparity. It was 9.93 points difference for Tyreek Hill when he played, you know, almost 21 points a game against bad defenses, but just 10 points against good ones. They couldn't take advantage the way that Jefferson did. Yeah, uh, they. I, I would agree with that. But at the same time, there's nothing negative you can say about Ty about Tyreek Hill. Maybe he didn't have as big a games against good matchups, but his his skill set fits this system so perfect. And Jalen Waddle, I mean, you saw Tyreek Hill over and over with Tua where he's flying down the field and he gets underthrown a deep ball, but he's so open that it doesn't matter. He could just come back for it, grab it, because you've got to watch Jalen Waddle underneath. So Tyreek Hill, not much to say about him other than make sure he's a top tier first round draft pick next year. Jalen Waddell uh, was number one in yards per reception this year, eighteen point one yards per reception. He's and got juice. Like if he if he didn't have Tyreek Hill's shadow yeah. cast upon him, you would say he's the next Tyreek Hill. That's the funny thing about Jalen Waddle. Yeah, the the only reason he was like the back of the fourth round for ADP this year was because of the Tyreek Hill trade. All right, at number three, Devontae Adams. All right. 53% good, 41% great, 18% bust, a, a stellar year for him, seventh in consistency. Um, I don't think I said the consistency ranks for Waddle, but he's at 15. Tyreek was at two, which is where he finished. But Devontae Adams at seven in consistency. It was worse over the, the last part of the year. Really, the last five games of the season kind of muddied that. I mean, it, it would have been much higher. Yeah, through the fantasy playoffs – he let you down more often than not because – Unless his, you had it, him in San Francisco in it, championship week. Yes, if you got to the championship game with Devontae Adams, uh, Mike, I think you did. I certainly uh, did. Oh, yeah, we, we did against the Borg, and uh, that was great because Devontae Adams was great. But a lot of people didn't get there because weeks 14, 15, 16 were disappointing. And that was Nathan well, Peterman against San Francisco. Was that Peterman? <laughs> yeah. Zach Stidham. Stidham. 
Yeah, oh, I'm seven. sorry. <laughs> They're the same. Yeah. I was <laughs> going to say same that, guy. that's what was missing. You had those three games uh, before <laughs> the explosion. It was the, the decline, clearly, of, of Derek Carr, as the Raiders thought. And they got to get uh, good. Did you call him Zach? No. Uh, Jarrett. Jarrett Stidham. Oh, Jarrett Stidham. Stidham. Okay. I do know a Zach Stidham. All Did right, you well, say we, Zach? Yep. You there know you a go. Zach Stidham? I do. You want to give a shout out to old Zachy? Gets I, a shout out. Nathan Peterman. Everybody gets yeah. a shout yeah. out today. I know a Nathan. <laughs> Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Adams was awesome. This was one of those. Uh, like, this, this surprised like we got, me. We got a lot right. We got a lot wrong. This was one spot where, like, I had Adams at three in my preseason rankings, and the heat was on for yes. that because I, you didn't see how can it be as good for Adams in Las Vegas, and it wasn't as good, I guess. But fifteen hundred yards and fourteen touchdowns. That's still pretty good. Like the Tyreek Hill one. It. Uh, I, I was I was nervous about what could Tua do with Tyreek Hill, and that was I mean clearly wrong. That one made more sense to me, as the like Tyreek Hill is still fully in his prime, still has his full speed. But it's like, can the translation of Devontae Adams, who is not an elite athlete, he's, he's still good, but he wins with just his skill as a wide receiver, and he was doing the vanishing, the Houdini, where he just appears wide open all the time. He, and the, he had more of those plays than anybody else. Like, defenses just forget that Devontae Adams is on the field. It it makes no sense. But his season, I think, was was far more surprising to me than all the other wide receivers that moved. A lot of times you you don't see on, on broadcast. You have to look at the All-22, and then you see he's got an invisibility cloak. <laughs> and you're like, oh, I see him take it off. Now he's wide they're, open. They're playing with 10 guys? Oh, no, there he is. Gotcha! 58, 48, 25, 38, 48, 31, 34, 31, 45, 60. That's a lot of numbers. Those were the distances for his touchdowns. Oh, man. Most of them. Big plays. I mean, big plays. So, uh, yeah, that cloak works well. Stephon Diggs comes in at number four. Uh, consistency rank of seven. Honestly, I thought he had, like, top three on lockdown until the end of the year. 1,400 yards, 11 touchdowns, 59% good, 24% great, just 18% bust rate, which is outstanding. But it, it was a really, really, really horrible fantasy football playoffs because it was yes. it was 58 at the position, 42, 66, and then deleted game. Right, yeah, your championship week, that game against the, the Bengals didn't get to happen, and depending on how your league handled that, I mean, he, Stephon Diggs was – everything you wanted him to be the entire season until it mattered the most and then he let you down but the truth on the season as a whole is he is the dude I don't think there was anything at the end of the year that looked like he slowed down that just those were the happenstance of, of those games if those games were spread out throughout the season you wouldn't have felt it you wouldn't have felt that collapse quite the same way totally agree and he's got enough pedigree where no one's going to hold that against him like if it was an up-and-coming wide receiver that had not proven themselves, I think you look at that and say, oh, no, what's happening next year? None of us have that doubt with Stephon Diggs. Correct. And he's got Josh Allen. Yeah, he'll he'll have I, – I have no doubt that the Buffalo Bills are going to try to bring in another good wide receiver to replace Gabriel Davis, uh, someone that can really – be that Emmanuel Sanders. Did we mention the, the the blurb that came out that said Gabe Davis was playing hurt all year? I didn't even see that. Yeah, they said I, I was it a high ankle sprain. I can't remember, but it just it came I out. I think you're making it up. Uh, okay, have, totally made up. Someone go ahead and sorry that. everybody. <laughs> yeah, totally well, made up. The 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 problem with playing through injury on the high ankle sprain is. He still got targets that hit him in the hand, <laughs> and so I was like, <laughs> okay, you. You ran down the field fine enough to get the do ball. Have, do you have a little, uh, I, I'm sensing a little Gabe Davis bitterness. I definitely have a little Some bit burns. of Gabe Davis bitterness because everything that, you know, he, he was a my guy this last year, someone that he had, he had his big games, helped you win some weeks. He wasn't a complete and utter bust, but everything that I loved about his situation came true. The opportunities were there for him. His his red zone opportunities, his target share, his targets from Josh, they were all there. He just, he himself wasn't good Didn't enough deliver. to capitalize on the opportunity given him. Which was the hope, obviously, yeah. that he could that he could do that. So, um, all right, let's, Mike, did you confirm your made-up injury or? No, it's it's in there. 
there okay. that he he heard it week one, but just people people just kind of like whispers. I'm obviously whispers and rumors on obviously Twitter. Obviously, very serious about you making up this injury. That's that's fine. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's AJ fine. Brown. I'm de- just trying to give Jason an out. De- <laughs> Thank you. I take it. Take it. He was played injured. Would have been great. Escape hatch. The escape hatch is great when it lets you double down next year. <laughs> uh, AJ Brown, Devontae Smith. They finished at five and ten. What a finish to the year for Devontae Smith and and AJ Brown. But uh, consistency wise, AJ Brown, the wide receiver, or I'm sorry, five in consistency. Devontae Smith. 12 in consistency. So that's awesome. There are some overarching wide receiver things to remember, truths from this year that we need to we need to not forget going forward, which is when a true superstar wide receiver is changing teams. And there's going to be all sorts of question marks, their quarterback situation, they come through. And then the other one is when you've got a great young wide receiver who's on his way up, and his situation looks worse. I mean, the value of Jalen Waddle and Devontae Smith in yeah. drafts might have been worth more than the value you got on A.J. Brown and Devontae Adams, even though they were great and better. But the the fact that Jalen Waddle and Devontae Smith fell in drafts because of those situations, because of the wide receivers added, they are just great wide receivers. It might, it might be one of the better lessons we learned. Because we saw it with, look, yes, T. Higgins did it. Right, Jamar Chase is added. T. Higgins is still great, but you had the backbone of Joe Burrow, and so you can say, "Oh, it's because Joe Burrow's great." Well, Tua wasn't great. I mean, he, he, you know, the expectation wasn't Tua being great. Waddle still did it, right? And then now you have Devontae Smith. Where look, some of it was AJ Brown was drafted as the wide receiver ten for a reason. Devontae Smith, the wide receiver thirty six for a reason. It, there were fears about is Jalen Hurts going to make that leap, mm-hmm. and then fears of is AJ Brown going to take all that you know, target share. And neither of those things, you know, like you said, talent won out. And there are other situations that I was in debate over on Twitter where you have to decide, is that guy elite, right? T Higgins, you have to decide, do you watch with your eyeballs and say, that guy's amazing. Devontae Smith, same thing. You know, the name Rashad Bateman came up because I said, I think, you know, you saw that target share in Baltimore. I'm like, they are adding a big name in Baltimore. That is happening. They'll, through trade, I don't know if it's Hopkins, I don't know if it's the draft. Baltimore's adding a wide receiver. And everybody else, they threw Devontae Smith's name and Jalen Waddell's name and T. Higgins' name at me. So you have to decide, is Rashad Bateman that guy so, or right, not? Because versus, versus, uh, if he is, then you prove that he can do it. Right. There's been a lot of uh, links to the New York Jets adding another wide receiver as well. I saw a draft where Jackson Smith and Jigba went there. If they were to you know try to make a splash, even though they've got Garrett Wilson, he looks great, but... That's a perfect example. Like, if they add someone, and Garrett Wilson, we know he's a stud. We know he's great. Just draft him like he's great. Do you the m- irony is, of course, that Elijah Moore, if you had made yeah, that yeah, judgment yeah. call on Elijah Moore last year with Garrett Wilson being added, you would have been wrong. The right. fall of Elijah Moore is just is still dumbfounding of, of what he put on tape, his draft capital, what, like everything that he should have been. And then this year, it, it, made, it still makes uh, n- not a ton of sense. Do you guys make anything, though, for Devontae Smith, who overall had an incredible year, but the real run where he was consistently great, that showed up when Dallas Goddard got hurt. Like, Dallas Goddard the mixed, missed weeks 11 through 15, and it was 13 through 17 where Smith dominated. And, like, and he was a, he was a, turned into a league-winning player because he was incredible during the playoffs. But it was just it was a little bit rocky to start the year, and then Goddard missed time, and Smith gets more acclimated in. Yeah, I mean, you look at the first twelve weeks of the season, and if you just look at those twelve weeks, you only had kind of you have three finishes inside the top twenty-four. Right. Yeah. So, how do you feel about that? You're somebody who had him on his roster, Jason. Yeah. There, there's, there's certainly truth to the fact that when Dallas Goddard, a great option is gone, that the target share is going to go more heavily to the other players. But I'm not worried about that long term. I don't think that there's. I mean, we saw, you know, a playoff game where ten targets, six receptions, sixty plus yards, and a touchdown for Devonta Smith. That was with, um, you know, with Goddard on the field. So I think Smith has leveled up and proven he is an awesome wide receiver. I don't think that his numbers go down next year. I would be curious. Obviously, Waddle finished slightly ahead of him 
do you look at that situation and, and prefer Waddle in a redraft league where, um, you know, Waddle had a tougher end of the season, Smith had a better end of the season. It was kind of inverse in the front half. It's, who's the quarterback? It's first. Tua, who, by the way, cleared protocol. Oh, he did. He did. He oh, cleared protocol today. That. But um, yeah, it's, I think it's I think it's Tua, especially with Brady rumors gone. Um, yeah, that's that's a great question. Who do you prefer, Devonta Smith or Jalen Waddle next year? I think I lean Waddle, but it's pretty close. I think it would be based on, you know, where do you think that these teams are headed? I mean, you could be coming back with a defending Super Bowl champion Philadelphia Eagles team, and Devontae Smith is great. Yeah, man. I love both of these players. They were my number one and number three wide receivers coming out of that draft class that year. So, who uh, did, did you have Smith at one? I had Smith at one, yeah. I, I'd probably lean Smith. Maybe it's just confirmation bias of – of that he belief. also just won you a title yeah he's pretty good yeah, you got the warm fuzzies right now mm -hmm. uh cd lamb came in at six his consistency rank was 11 it was a breakout year for cd lamb 1359 yards nine touchdowns 59 percent good games 12 percent great 24 percent bust he was much better the second half of the year. If you look at the first half versus second half breakdown, the first half of the year, he was, his consistency rank was 23. He wasn't that good. He felt like a bad draft pick. He felt like, man, I took this guy at the one-two turn, and he's letting me down. Now, obviously, a lot of those games in the first half of the year were without Dak. Dak went down in Two week through one. six. So, you know, it's like that being said, he had two top eight finishes without Dak, so you can't really blame it entirely on that. But the second half of the season, I think, is where you saw him truly break out with Dak. He was extremely consistent. He he was the wide receiver four in consistency from that point on. And I, he'll be a tough draft pick next year. Yes. New OC. Yeah. New wide receiver somewhere. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he had 156 targets. I mean, you spent a lot of time in the offseason – kind of reminding us that like when when there are other options in Dallas, Dak has spread the ball around. He didn't have other options this year. No, no he didn't. So that it'll be an interesting debate. I what what is nice on the pro CD Lamb side is that he showed himself he's, to have he's a the, really good player. to have the alpha in him. He is capable of being the wide receiver one and being a dominant wide receiver one for the team. We know that for a fact now, so we can't take that away. But the situation could change where his targets go down because there's another great option to throw the ball to. We'll have you know TBD on that. But I think the truth of who C.D. Lamb is is he is capable of being a great fantasy player. Number four in consistency over the second half of the year, that stretch that you were talking about. Here's a player I'm completely confused about. Someone help me, <laughs> unless you're confused as well. But Amon Ross St. Brown at eight is genuinely a little bit confusing to me. He's super confusing. Um. He was drafted as the wide receiver 25, so he was an amazing value for, for fantasy players. His consistency rank, though, was 22, right? Finished at 8, 22 in consistency. He busted 25% of the time. He was only good 31% of the time and great 19% of the time. You look at these stretches of the season, and they're like, you know, he, he, they're okay. There were weeks where he was okay, and there were weeks where he looked like one of the best players in football. But I just feel like the storyline for – Amon Ra is going to it's going to mimic that stuff we were talking about where look Jamison Williams is a an unbelievable player in my opinion. And those players and I know he barely got on the field they generally, you know, they turn into superstars. Yeah. That he's their Jamar Chase, no question. So, you go into next year, Amon Ra is a 146 target player. Does that make him Tyler Boyd? Yeah, I have the Or does it make him um Elijah Higgins. Moore? Uh, yeah, does it make it the bad? The bad version is the Boyd and the the more. Well, cause, yeah, I'm saying. But like, is he the T Higgins? Uh, is like he Tyler Boyd? Tyler Boyd was turning into what looked like a, a great fantasy football player, and then over time they added Higgins and Jamar Chase, and then Boyd got relegated to just a, a huge spike week every once in a while. Nothing consistent. No, I I I am I will be all in on Amon Ross St. Brown next year. Okay. I think that he. You're on Team Sun God. I am on Team Sun God. Uh, rah rah rah! Uh, the 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 situation that, that he found himself or in. Lady Gaga. I was trying to figure <laughs> that out myself. Uh, that was cheerleader. Uh, it wasn't rah 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 rah. rah, rah. Um, Come on. <laughs> no, rah. that was that was pom poms. Um, okay. 
it was pretty <laughs> pathetic if it was cheerleader. Yeah. No, no offense. <laughs> what we need to remember <laughs> is he got injured in week four. Yeah. Out with an ankle injury. Um, he tried to come back and really couldn't. The next two games where he played, he kind of didn't play. 32% of snaps, 17% of snaps. So those are active in his... If you take those were games... The, those were part of his... Uh... Those are part of his score. If I take those two games out, which is fair to... You know, we're trying to find what's the truth of the player. He would have had the consistency score of number 12. He would have had one of the lowest bust rates in the entire league. Um, and a, a, a pretty good finish, 21% of his games at the great level. I think he will be someone to me that I see more as a T. Higgins, where the situation is going to look worse for him. He's not going to be crazy highly drafted because there there will be question marks. I think the talent, we've seen enough stretches of him being a really – Dominant hit, first read where a possession moving guy, you know, a Michael Thomas type of I I just take this ball and I snap it and I throw it right to him because I know where he's going to be. He's going to be there on time. He's strong. He's going to break a tackle every now and then and, and make a special play happen. That's I wonder if his career arc is the, the Landry-esque type of career, though. It's a good comp. Where you have, like he scored six times this year. He had 106 catches, so PPR, hallelujah. But I do wonder if the touchdowns will be so, you know, five to six range for his career that, like, he finished at eight. I want to give him all the credit in the world, but would you project him as a top 12 next year? Um, or would you just enjoy those delicious PPR numbers as a wide receiver, too, if you can get it there? I will. I, I mean, obviously, we, we, we're we going to get in after the NFL draft to get all the numbers done. So No, nope, final answer. <laughs> final answer. Um, my initial rankings, I would expect that he'll be – probably right around wide receiver 12. I think he'll be in my top 12. Amari Cooper rounds out hey, our list today. Is. Amari Cooper, against all odds, with various quarterbacks, finishes at nine. Consist well, really with Jacoby. Yeah, I mean, but how long was, uh, what do you got, four or five weeks with? Six, with Vol I think. Voldy? Five or six, I'll, I'll check that. It was six. Okay, yeah, it's a, it's a decent run. I mean. Six and then and uh, four of those were terrible yeah he he was not he was not good with with Voldemort the standard for success though for Amari Cooper was very low he was drafted as the wide receiver 31 his consistency rank was 17 his second half rank was 30 35 which was really bad uh 41 percent busts better at home dealt with the quarterback situation I you know I think what we saw and the truth of Amari Cooper is that if you kind of wade through the numbers and you just rely on what you saw in the field, is he still Amari Cooper? I think that's the biggest message to okay, me. Okay, that's a fair question. Amari Cooper is still Amari Cooper, and he was he was able to make uh, elite plays on a regular basis. He was clearly the best receiver that they had on this team. Like in the, we were looking back at the rookie drafts, the rookie mock drafts before last season, and David Bell had he was showing up on a lot of them. Because we didn't know how much Amari Cooper had left. And we right. didn't know where Donovan Peoples-Jones was going to fit into that. And David Bell made no impact in his first season. So Amari Cooper, at least this year, was a value. And he doesn't seem like the kind of player that's going to be a highly drafted commodity next year. Yeah, I, a lot of that will come down to what uh, fantasy managers think of Voldemort. Whether they believe he will get <laughs> better next season. And they think Deshaun Watson uh, bounces back. He gets to practice. He gets an offseason. All of that. Is and, there a wizard spot on rosters <laughs> yeah um it's like a flex if you believe that deshaun watson's going to be better i could see amari cooper getting a lot of buzz getting drafted a little bit higher because of how good he was on the season and the fact that his quarterback situation hey guys his quarterback situation is going to be way better this year than it was last year but that's probably not true i just did the math i wanted to see because we got the first half of the second half but i wanted to look pure and simple who was he with Brissett and who was he with Deshaun Watson? And if you take those two situations, our consistency metric, he was the wide receiver 10 with Jacoby Brissett. Very consistent, very good. And in the games with Voldemort, he was the wide receiver 45. Woo! So I will not be, you know, I, I, I will not be in the camp of thinking that Voldemort's going to become a good guy. 
yeah, I mean, he, he, he'll he be 29, too, when the season starts. The identity of this team has still been Nick Chubb. So I think that there will be a lot of doubters in the Amari Cooper camp. But, you know, we know that teams that even when they have that identity, there is that alpha. There is that player that they need to turn to. This is not the 1980s. Cooper will be, what do you think, like a late fourth, fifth round? I, I would imagine probably fourth round, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe fifth. If there's some rookies in good situations that people might take them ahead of Amari Cooper and you know, that first five, six weeks of the year, he might be going, oh, gosh, I should have taken Amari Cooper again. He could become the Frank Gore of the wide receiver position very soon. <laughs> he's, he's He could be eternal. Do, he's been doing this so long. He, it's just always surprising because he was drafted so young and was good right off the bat that he's still 28 years old. You know, we're, we're talking about guys that feel, you, you know, he just feels so old, but he's, he's really not. Yeah, like me. Yeah, yeah. maybe, maybe, yeah, right? maybe, yeah, right. yeah, sure. Get out there as I as I limp in here after a pickleball match, fellow young kids, <laughs> fellow young. All right, well, uh, I think that's it, Brooksy. No, any surprises in the news category? No, sir. Nothing. How no. how are you comfortable sitting next to Papa Josh? I know close proximity. I wish I had my glasses. Yeah. 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 With the glare. Sunglasses. Yeah. yeah. No, I hear you. Yeah. yeah. All right. That is going to do it. We're done. We're going to have a second episode about wide receivers, though, and dig into some of those uh, very important names, find out the truth. Jason's going to do some research. Step out of the gosh and blur. Bring it. I'll be here in real life next time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Promises, promises. Take care, Foot Clan. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Fantasy Footballers Podcast. Join our fantasy football community on jointhefoot.com and follow us on Twitter at the FFBallers.